Uh, today I'm going to talk about um, this paper that I read. Um, it's from a conference that I attended about a month ago. Um, there was another paper too that I also wanted to present that was also on um, uh, spatial representations, but um, I didn't. I ran out of time, didn't end up getting to that. But this one focuses more on grid cells, so I'll be talking about this. Um, by the way, I just want to say um, this is my first time um, presenting on grid cells, so I did get a lot. I did get the high-level ideas out of this paper, but there are probably a lot of low-level details that uh, that I missed out on. So just uh, just a disclaimer. Okay. Uh, so first, before we talk about um, the grid cell aspect of uh, spatial representations, um, there's a lot of background that uh, might be worth going through. So this research group in particular uh, has spent a lot of time working on semantic pointers. And so just high level idea of semantic pointers is that they, they're they all used to represent concepts like red, square, etc. cetera. Um, uh, and and it, it, seems, it seems a lot like they're, there's, they're somewhat similar to Wirtivec or these neural representations that we get just um, because the, some of the original papers that they cited on this was were back from like going back to 2010 when we didn't really have things like Wirtivec. So um, some important um, uh, things you can do with these semantic pointers are you can bind them, um, like uh, you can bind two vectors and then they can be unbinded. So you can, re re can if you originally get U as V, uh, v, v binded with W, then you can you can get V back by doing this operation. Um, I'm not entirely sure if this is a sort of a one-to-one -one mapping that you, that there's only one um, thing that you can they always get exactly V back by unbinding, but um, they claim that it, it uh, seems to work like this. So here you would use the inverse uh, uh, of W. The um, so this is all pretty high level, um, but what what's really going on here is um, they're using a they usually use a circular convolution to perform this operation, which, is, which I think is like a discrete Fourier transform. Um, yeah. And so I, uh, here's, a, here's a bit more of a concrete example that, that, I, that I came across that might help explain things. So if you have um, a red square and a blue circle in a picture, then you can probably represent that as being, uh, as binding the red and square semantic pointers together and then add, adding that to the blue and circ uh, blue and circle semantic pointers also binded together, and then if you wanted to find out what the um, color of the square was in the picture, then you would apply the um, the the approximate inverse of the semantic pointer of square to to v, and you'd get so, so the, the square inverse this distributes over uh, addition so you'd get, so, so the square and the square's approximate inverse would cancel out. So you'd get red here back. And then, and then to this term, they claim that you just get noise. So you'd be able to pretty much retrieve red. I wasn't entirely sold on this, but I'll take it at face value. So this is the idea of a semantic pointer. It, it seems pretty similar to um, like word back that we sort of had. What, what, what is it, you know, I, I read this paper, um, but I, I didn't understand a lot of it because this yeah. semantic pointer thing was, was uh, I think I've run across it before, but I didn't really understand it. And then, and then when they started talking about how, how these operations actually work, but it wasn't clear that was, was this a neural model at all? Or is this just a mathematical model for how to do these things? There wasn't a neural model, no. There was not? There, there was a negative? Like, there was no, like in, in all the stuff they talked about on semantic pointers, there mm. was nothing to do with neural networks. Mm. Okay. Yeah. I, so, but I, uh, yeah. So I'm just curious to see where this goes because I have not looked at this paper. Uh, but this seems so much like vector symbolic architectures, and yeah. we've 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 talked to people who work on those a little bit and drawn like a a a, uh, a analog that displacement cells perform a sort of binding operation. And if you have a square uh, a square grid code and a red grid code, you can treat them as like a displacement. And then you can do all these same operations by setting up this binding operation as applying and removing a displacement. So like, it's, it's just interesting to, to see this. I'm wondering where this is going. Well, okay. it also reminds me of the stuff that Penny Kinerva did. I forget yeah. what he calls it. Is that the same Vector, thing? That, that's it, that's it. That's, oh, that's okay. what on, those vector symbolic uh, architectures. Yeah, but I never felt that was a good neural model. I just couldn't never make it work. But you, I, I don't remember this. I, I'm sorry if I got that. I don't remember that. That, that was a little bit more me, Marco, and Scott kind of, okay. uh, you know, we're on a whiteboard about that. But the idea is that um, 
that you can take you can take what Penti Kinerva has been talking about and uh, use two concepts: displacement cells and unions, and you get a full vector symbolic architecture. And what uh, Karan has shown here, red binded to square, that's a displacement vector. Uh, and then the plus addition is like a union. Uh, like we, we, can, we can translate all of this, not necessarily we should, but I'm just saying yeah. you can take these grid cell operations that we use um, and, and, and do all this. So anyway, I, I've yeah. jumped in for long enough. I'm curious to see where okay. this is going. So Marcus, it's interesting that you mentioned um, VSAs because in the in the papers where they describe these um, semantic pointers, they do mention that a lot. I don't have um, too much background on that area, so I sort of left it out just for simplicity. Um, yeah, okay. So th those were semantic pointers. Um, and then one of their recent papers from last year, they showed how to build spatial semantic pointers, which are basically the same concept, but applied to spatial locations. So here, um, to, uh, what, what you would do is, um, for each, uh, for each, say you have um, x, y, which is a, which gives you a point on a two D grid, right? If you want to represent that using semantic pointers, um, they would, you'd pick, you'd pick. Um, so big X and big Y here are fixed semantic pointers, and each of them. So these are semantic pointers that are um, that represent the dimension. So so these these are fixed. They're not they're not variable. They're they're fixed. Um, and they represent a certain dimension. So one could be the x axis and the other one could be the y axis. And then um, you would get the spatial semantic pointer by um, uh, basically uh, getting, I guess, um, semantic pointers for, e for each of the dimensions and then binding those together. So, um, so here, uh, wh what's going on is continuous binding. So the, um, see here, x, is, x and y are, small x and small y are real numbers. They're not, um, they're not necessarily um, integers. So they, they uh, using a Fourier transform, they just, they, de they define exactly what, exactly how this is done. Uh, the details aren't too important. Um, and so, um, so this is how they come up with their spatial semantic pointers. Um, and I guess the, the neat thing here is that they, 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 they aim to show that um, when you have, when you have an, uh, a concept like H, so H can be a, uh, just a regular semantic pointer for something like an object, landmark, or person, or something else, then um, you can actually bind that together with its um, with its spatial with with its spatial semantic pointer, so that you're sort of binding the concept with the location. So you can say if so if certain landmark is at a certain position, you can bind that landmark with the position that it's in, um, and then and then and, and, and since. You, and then since it's uh, derived like this, you can actually figure out the location of some object by taking the, by taking like um, H inverse and multiplying it um, by this, binding it together with this. So there's just, just a bunch of, bunch of arithmetic going on here. Okay, so that's the idea of spatial semantic pointers. And these are gonna be used for the, um, for, to build grid, -like, grid cell-like representations. Uh, so by the way, uh, I just want to mention that it wasn't entirely clear to me right away what the advantage of having a spatial semantic pointer was over just a regular semantic pointer that shows a, uh, uh, that gives a particular location of an object. But I guess this, these prob this probably has some properties that um, just regular semantic pointers don't satisfy. Okay, so now we get to the, um, uh, the, the, the modeling problem here. So, um, so the goal here is to find um, grid cell representations, to, to discover grid cell representations of the observed place cell responses. So the, the representations of locations that we've obtained from the spatial semantic pointers, the SSPs, um, those, are, those, are, those, are, those are like our observations here. And then we want to uncover um, grid cell representations for those. And so um, how this is done is, um, uh, just through a um, minimization of, okay, so this is sort of like a, um, it's, this can be done in, in, this can be a neural model or it can just be just a regular regression problem. So, so you're I'm, trying, yeah. I'm just making sure I understand you're saying that they're, they're trying to derive grid cells from place of representations. Is that right? Yeah. And then, yeah, so they're, it's, it's almost like they're encoding it. So they want to encode these observations that they have, which are taken from their spatial semantic pointers, which are supposed to represent yeah. Place cell responses under this kind of scheme. I mean, to say, okay, we're trying to recreate some physiological uh, effect we see, which are grid cells. Do they? 
ascribe why they're doing that and what the grid cells are doing and or is it just like hey we can get this this sort of response pattern if we do this operation so in there so when they talked about their results um, they didn't really apply it to any particular task where grid cells would be particularly useful but um, I, I'm guessing that you could um, say you have some toy task where you would want to uh, you know you have some sort, sort of spatial representations you could use these grid cell representations that you derive that, that you learn from your place cell um, observations uh, instead of using the original SSPs that they had before or any other sort of spatial representation. I mean the beautiful thing about grid cells is there's several very important things one is they do this this path integration based on movement yeah yeah and so so yeah. just just deriving them from place cells doesn't give you that at all yeah and um, and, yeah. and then you have these other things they have the the, the whole uh, data um, procession um, effect which is very critical and so again that wouldn't come it's a time-based thing a movement-based thing so I just didn't know how deep they went here you know some people just say hey look we can get cells to respond like x but that's not really what we need you know we need something much richer than that so I don't know if they it sounds like they didn't go there too much they did uh, note that um, it right now the grid cell representations that they uncovered they don't satisfy the path integration property that seems to be like a, a huge hole yeah. <laughs> so it's like just question for clarity so right now you're showing uh this this other stuff from this other paper this pattern formation one from the ganguly group uh is this is this did the semantic pointer paper also do these techniques did they cite this paper i'm curious what made yeah. you jump in yeah this so paper. there so uh, i think th so this task here of um constructing of basically encoding from your observations to uh, grid cell like representations and back to your observations. This was a, a problem, or this was framed in the Ganguly paper. And then there are, this is what they're um, applying their SSPs to. Okay. Yeah. Um, so they yeah, show so, so like uh, to, to jump in just a, a little bit about this paper, uh, their, their group decided to take a different look at grid cells for a for just to entertain the idea of can you explain grid cells from the lens through the lens of pattern formation? Is, is the, the, the terminology they they use. So they, they de-emphasize path integration in this paper, but these same authors will uh, will include path, path integration in other papers. So they're just exploring this angle. Okay. So you're so you're familiar with um with this work, Marcus, is that right? Somewhat. Uh, yeah. And so is Michelangelo has also looked at this some. But uh, and then plus Surya Ganguly is a professor at Stanford. This this group is a Stanford group. Okay, cool. So when they um, wanted to come up with these uh, representations for uh, in, in this in this layer G here, um, they had one they had a constraint, and that was that the the activation values of these sort of units here would um, would take on this form. So what you what we have here is um, is basically you have we're summing over three terms, and so there there are these three. Um, what they call plane cells um, wasn't exactly clear how these plane cells are derived, um, but it uh, but the, they have three different plane plane cells, and then it also takes as input the um, the spatial uh, the SSP the, the spatial representation um, which is the observation here, and ultimately what 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 th what this is is um, just a sum of these different um, sort of cosine curves, uh, and so. And so, but they mentioned that it's each cell or unit that um, that has this activation like this. But they didn't mention whether there's a relationship between the different units as to whether, like, you know, um, as to whether they're related or whether they're all independent of each other. Because if they were related, that would sort of make sense because you have this sort of periodic pattern going on. Um, but they didn't make any mention of that. But otherwise, um, they did constrain their sort of representations here to sort of follow this pattern. And so that's how they, I guess, got things that looked like this. Yes, a quick question. Um, I understand the plane reference, but they have K there as a vector, which means that the three components, say at three different frequencies, could actually be heading in different directions. They don't necessarily have to be aligned with each other. Is that something that, I mean, that's that's what I see with, from that equation. Is that something they were talking about? Yeah, so they're, um, in the case where they have three of these, um, they're all exactly 120 degrees apart. And um, they all sum up to the zero vector in the space that they live in. Okay, so it's not arbitrary. They actually, uh, those, those Ks are uh, discrete. Yeah, exactly. Okay. 
Yeah, and they're all the same. They're all the same length, just po pointing in different directions. Oh, the, they're the same length. Yeah, I, I, I see three different frequencies being summed here. Spatial frequencies being summed. So when you say the same length, what does that mean? The norm of the k vectors. Um, uh, okay, got it, got it, got it. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So, um, so one important, um, I guess, engineering aspect here that they had to look into was um, how they're exact, how they're going to pick their um, pick these these semantic pointers, the big X and the big Y, and so they, they refer to these as bases. Um, because how you how you pick these um, basically determines what your grid cell representation looks like here, and so they picked certain ones um, so that they would get uh, so that they would, so that you would get this sort of activation uh, over here, and um, and so they showed they showed in, in these pictures here that um, when they had when they had uh, this, these specific encodings, so they, when, they, when they picked their X and Y um, semantic pointers so that you would get that sort of activation, um, that you'd get, you'd get these sort of firing patterns. Um, and then when you picked random encodings, you'd get, um, you get very sparse patterns that look like this. Uh, and finally, they um, showed some results. Uh, they, they didn't really apply this to any tasks. But they did, um, I guess reconstruction was the only real task they did here, where they tried to go from their, they tried to go from the original spatial semantic pointer to the representation level, and then back to the, um, back to their observation. And they show that if they're using, um, if they're using, if they encode it such that it, it looks like, uh, it looks like those, the sum of those, um, the sinusoidal curves, you're getting, a, you're, you're reconstructing it a lot better. Otherwise, random is just a random encoding, which doesn't necessarily give you grid cell-like representations at all. Um, and that's giving you a higher um, Frobenius norm. And then this is kind of similar. They talk about place cell centers, um, being able to reconstruct the center of your um, observation, uh, or how, how far the center was from your input to your output. Um, yeah. So that's it. But I guess, I guess the high level idea is um, trying to get, they sort of got something that looks, looks like grid cells, but as Jeff, you pointed out, um, there's a lot of properties that are, that are still missing and they made note of that um, in their work too. This reminds me a lot of the, um, if you look at the, if you show your graphs, reminds me a lot of the paper where uh, if you start with place cell res responses and then you do non-negative principal component analysis, you get you get responses that look like grid cells. And of course, PCA will automatically be trying to minimize the reconstruction error. And so um, it seems like you kind of have to get this graph <laughs> almost. Um, like it, it's, you know, you don't have a choice. Uh, like it is it, grid cell. Is, is, that are is, that hard. is that suggesting it's it's less interesting, uh, uh, trivial? Or well, it's I'm just it's saying this this these graphs are not surprising, given the previous result that P PCA on place cell responses will give you grid cell like responses. Mm. That implies that grid cell responses will minimize the reconstruction error of place cell mm. outputs. It's sort okay. of a mathematical equivalence almost. The only trick is that they they had to do this thing called non-negative principal component analysis. So that's the only piece. But um, so in that yeah. sense, it's not surprising, I guess. Yeah, I would have liked to seen them use their um, grid cell like representations uh, applied to some some sort of navigation task, which they didn't really do. Um, but I think that would have that. I, I think if that if we were able, actually able to perform well, that would have made it a lot more interesting. Yeah, but I think as you mentioned, you know, they they you have to do the uh, you know path integration property. Yeah, yeah, you yeah. have to have that. None I mean, of these really address that. You know, no one really understands how grid cells and place cells will you know really work. I mean, <laughs> in terms of um, there's a lot of uncertainty about how they how we navigate using them, and um, and so there's a lot of, there's a series of literature, and I would include this as part of it, which is saying, okay, we don't really understand the, the bigger picture of how all this stuff works. Let's see if we can just recreate this physiology or explain how these things come about. 
uh, what might be some of the inter mechanisms that lead to these things, which is valuable. But I, I, seem, I would be very especially surprised if they tried to actually do some more of an end-to-end -end analysis on this. Ryan, can I ask you to go to the previous slide again? This one? Yeah. So uh, that equation you have in the upper left-hand corner, is that a convolution operation? Uh, this is a um, circular convolution. Okay. So, so yeah. Okay. I just want to make sure because the SXY seem to be in the in the uh, spatial domain rather than the frequency domain. So, so the X and Y are basically uh, uh, some of these these plane equations. Is that what it is? They're they, they, but they're in the spatial domain when they're when they're doing these operations. Are you talking about the big X and big Y? Yeah. Um, so those are. So those are. From what I understood, those are semantic pointers representing um, one representing the, the x dimension, one representing the y dimension. Um, they're in they're in the they're in the same space as each other. Okay. So. So this so this operation doesn't change the dimensionality of. Um, no, I just want to make you, know, you made references to Fourier transforms, so that's why I was I was trying to make sure I understood what operation, what, which which domain you were actually in when you're doing this. Yeah. Okay, so so basically, you're you're convolving you're convolving plane waves with other plane waves in different dimensions. So, all right, I can I can see how you're going to get these these patterns. I'm just it's it's a it's a <clears throat> it's just a uh, interesting. Uh, uh, okay, thank you. Uh, in fact, if if you want to. If you're interested in the details, it looked, um, they had it here somewhere. So it looked something like this. So I think F here is the Fourier transform. Um, this is exactly how they're doing it. Okay, so, but they're using a Hadamard product, which yeah. would be what you would do in the, in the, uh, in the frequency domain. So the Fourier transform in the frequency, okay. So yeah, so that's, they're, is, they're essentially doing a convolution. This is just a cheap yeah. form of doing the convolution. Yeah. Okay. And it has to be circular because if they're using FFTs, it's inherently circular. It's not clear that that grid cells and whatever they're trying to represent, you know, are inherently circular. Right, right, right. Okay, thank you. Did One you, other just side note, uh, the paper um, Suvita mentioned about non-negative PCA. Um, so just to throw in a couple details there, uh, like it was first found that principal component analysis uh, will lead to something kind of grid-like, but they're like more square grids than hexagonal. And then that paper that Suvita mentioned said, noted that, um, that if you do non-negative PCA, some reason is hexagonal. Um, this other, the, the paper that Quran was showing from um, Sarsher and Ganguly and all, um, that jumped in and gave a theoretical explanation for why the non-negativity constraint caused it to be hexagonal rather than a square grid. So that was one of their contributions. Um, in general, there's this like space of questions of, um, why does principal component analysis, or, or some people talk about it in terms of eigenvectors, why does that lead to these grids and what, uh, how do we make sense of that? And does that have anything to do with grid cells and the, and the anorhinal cortex? And they, they end up causing questions for each other. Like even, even if it doesn't have anything to do, do with anorhinal cortex, it still raises a bunch of interesting analytical questions. Like why did it become hexagonal? So people then write papers about that. Uh, and anyway, that's, yeah, that's no, one I, way to think about these. I think the tie-in is very intriguing because Hebbian learning will do principal components extraction. Yeah. So it's, there's just like, there seems to be like all these elements that <laughs> seem to yeah. somehow point to grid cells being a natural representation in, in, in this scenario. You could also yeah. look at it as, a, as like a warning or as a thing you need to be cautious about that um, if you see grid cells in your network, 
are you seeing actual grid cells or are you just seeing principal components that are kind of a red herring? Are, are they right. the, 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 the <laughs> trap you can fall into? Are they actually, is it actually like a siren song of principal components? As, yeah. I, I'm not stating an opinion on this. I'm being cautious. Like, is it maybe it's a siren song? Maybe it's the real thing. Yeah. I, I have a question about the figure that's in, on, on the screen right now. So there's uh, three sets of grid cell uh, modules at different spatial resolutions there. Does this- Are you just the, the, the bottom ones? No, the upper left here, the uh, top okay. center, under the G. Um, so- you, you, So you see there's like a, the first yeah. four is one resolution, the next is small, the next yeah. is small. Does this produce all three of those at the same time? Or is this like, I'm just curious, uh, why, why the different resolutions, the resolutions there? Is, is this I think, I think that's just for um, diagram purposes. Um, this was, so this image was actually taken from the, from, um, from this paper, from the Sorcerer mm. paper that uh, Marcus was talking about. Um, but as, just, as, far, as far as I understood it, um, in their setup, G and P were just, are just matrices where, um, where the first axis just corresponds to the, the example, uh, the, the, the input example, and then the other mm. axis actually corresponds to the different, the different cells in that unit, in that layer. Mm. Uh, all right, so I guess my answer is, I, I'm not sure I got the answer, but it, it seems like you're saying it's there for illustration purposes, like this is what grid cells look like, as opposed to this set of particular P's going under this operation will lead to a, a series of grid cell modules at different resolutions. Um, is that, yeah, I don't think, I don't think it's, the, it's the latter one. Okay, all right, just a little bit misleading looking at that. You know, there's one other possibility, the one, one you know, we were just talking about how grid cells may just be a, a sort of a, artifact of PCA, I guess, is what you're saying. Um, but, you know, one of the things that I've been working on, and I've talked about a bunch of times, is that there's a real, dealing in two-dimensional uh, grid cell arrays is really problematic in a lot of ways. Um, and so I've, I've been, keep finding myself going down the road of wanting to do um, path integration in one dimensions and representing movements in one dimensions. And, and um, of course, you combine movements, multiple movement vectors, you end up uh, with a grid cell like representation. But also that it could be just that we need, one of the things that grid cells have to do is they have to maintain their activity in the absence of sensory input. Um, they have to be stable, you know, like you're standing in a room and you close your eyes, you still know where you are, you know, it doesn't go away for a long period of time. And so there has to be stable representations and the general belief is that uh, sort of a continuous attractive networks will produce that kind of situation. So if you're trying to produce a stable representation in a two dimensional sheet of cells um, using sort of uh, general surround inhibition expectation principles, you'll end up with something like this. It's like just what you end up with. So another possibility is that I find very intriguing is that the whole two dimensional representation of grid cells is really just an artifact of, of I've been needing at some point in time to form a stable representation, um, but that's not really the operating um, uh, uh, view of the world, <laughs> if that makes any sense. So I'll, uh, in my next presentation, which is probably Monday, I'll show some stuff that kind of supports that idea. Uh, oh, that good. <laughs> that it really kind of connects a lot of what's, what's drawn here to, uh, to that. It's funny seeing this, the, the connections, you'll see. Uh, actually, I have a figure out that I could show real quick. If, well, I'd be really happy because, you know, it's, it's kind of going out on a limb saying, hey, all this two-dimensional grid, grid cell stuff is not really true at all. It's really a bunch of one-dimensional grid cells. And that would be, you know, really contrary to almost all conventional views. And so if there's any, but I keep finding myself deciding that must be the case. So I can't figure out how to get away from that. So if there's a comparable evidence for other evidence, for it, that'd be exciting for me. There's, I, let's see, there's probably, there's a mix of empirical evidence, some of it, and there's also other theorists who, uh, who have the same desires as you. Uh, like, I, I would say that, um, like, Neil Burgess, Tim Behrens, uh, that, um, and um, th this other paper, I'll present some of their, um, some of their insights. Um, they also embrace the same idea. And it, uh, so, you, you know, the, you know, like velocity controlled oscillators, VCOs, yeah, yeah. Uh, the, the people working on that, that, that's conceptually the same thing as like a 1D grid cell, except it's uh, the phases and time. Yeah, no, it, it, it's interesting. I, th I think when um, um, we had a presentation 
um, where we were talking about different ways that those could come about. One of those, the velocity control oscillators was definitely sort of like, hey, these are one-dimensional things, so you combine them. But then there was also the idea that an individual neuron could have different velocity control oscillators on each of its dendrite branches. Um, remember that? Um, the, like there was inherent oscillations in the dendrites. Um, is, it, is that like familiar? Yeah, I mean, I remember yeah. that there are some oscillatory models that depend on yeah. that. I mean, so that would be one where like you don't go, to, it, you don't actually, there would be no separate one dimensional uh, grid cells that somehow that they, they go right to 2D because the cells do it themselves. But anyway, all right, well, good. So yeah, you're right. Um, I guess you could think of the VCO as supporting that idea. You're right. Yeah, and that's com compatible with what I've been thinking, so. Great. Yeah. If I if I can share my screen real quick, I'll just give you a preview of some figures that I'll I'll be showing soon, um, and it's just funny to see. So um, let's see. Here's this. And, and by the way, this this Miro uh, notebook uh, whiteboard thing is cool. I'm going to be using it more. I, I'm is that the thing that is that the thing that someone sent to me? And yeah, I, said, well, I think Will, Will Warren sent to sent, and I've been using it, and it's good. Like you can draw on on on, on an iPad. You can then write on it on your computer and it also is just syncing live and it, it works really nicely. Uh, mm. So the the figures up here up top are a little bit reminiscent of what um, of what Karan was just showing except this is the more square version of them. Um, the, the, I went through a similar technique to generate these um, and an insight that I'm going to show is that uh, okay so I'm going to describe all this in terms of these are eigenvectors of of space essentially um, but these down here you can kind of rotate the set of four to get these instead rotation in the sense like a high dimensional rotation uh, so these are also eigenvectors of space uh, and these are going to i'm going to draw a connection from here to uh, vcos to velocity controlled oscillators and to rings and and these are the different scales uh, and um, the different scales of the, of the grid cell modules and by the way like what i've what I've described here, other people have pointed out the the paper from Burgess, Barons, etc., uh, generates these types of figures. Uh, but I will make a nice like observation of how these are actually the same as these, just rotated. They're in the same eigenspace, quote unquote. But uh, I'll talk about that on Monday. One thing, one reason I wanted to show this is uh, these actually do come out in sets of four, sort of like how Karan was showing these sets of four. Uh, these, uh, these sets of four cells at one uh, scale, sets of four uh, fields at another scale, that actually might not be a, a pure visualization trick. There's actually a technical reason why these come out in fours like this. Hmm. It's like the sine and cosine, sine and cosine going in two different directions. So anyway, that's, that's more of a preview. 